If you, like Elon Musk, dream of colonizing Mars and begin planning seriously, you'll quickly run into some major logistical challenges. Establishing a permanent settlement on the Red Planet would require transporting materials and people on a massive scale. SpaceX's current strategy involves launching a fleet of 1,000 starships during the roughly month-long Mars launch window, which comes once every 26 months. While the idea of sending 1,000 spacecraft sounds ambitious, it raises practical concerns. Each starship would need to be refueled in orbit before heading to Mars, likely requiring around 1,000 propellant depots. Fortunately, SpaceX would have about 25 months between launch windows to refill these depots, a process that could take up to 8,000 launches using Starship tanker vehicles. These tankers are designed for rapid reuse, so the total number of tankers needed wouldn't have to match the number of flights. Still, scaling operations to that level presents significant engineering, logistical, and economic challenges. But what if there were a larger version of Starship, a spacecraft so much bigger than the current design that it could dramatically reduce the number of vehicles needed for a Mars mission? In theory, such a super-heavy starship could even carry enough fuel to eliminate the need for orbital refueling entirely. Believe it or not, that's exactly the kind of solution Elon Musk has been considering, and he's been thinking about it for quite some time. In 2016, Elon Musk proposed an interplanetary transport system featuring a massive 12-meter diameter launch vehicle. This rocket would generate over 13,000 tons of thrust, or 128 meganewtons, at liftoff and be capable of carrying 300 tons to low Earth orbit, all while remaining fully reusable. But that's not the end of it. Elon Musk has long suggested that the next logical step in Starship's development is to increase its core diameter from 9 meters to 18 meters. Imagine a rocket with a jaw-dropping diameter of 18 meters, twice as wide as the current Starship. That's wider than the Saturn V's first stage at 10 meters, and even the Soviet Union's enormous N1 rocket, which topped out at 17. With that kind of scale, it wouldn't just be the biggest, it would officially be the widest rocket ever built. This massive upgrade would solve many challenges by increasing both the payload mass and internal volume by a factor of four without increasing the vehicle's height. As a result, the number of starships needed for each Mars launch window, currently estimated at 1,000, could be reduced to around 250, a far more manageable figure. Even if used solely to deliver propellant to orbit, the larger Starship could cut the number of tanker flights by at least 3,750 and potentially eliminate the need for orbital propellant depots entirely. This scale-up would not only make Mars colonization more feasible, but also streamline resource allocation for lunar missions. Building a sustainable Mars colony requires more than just people, infrastructure, Habitats, food supplies, and equipment must all be transported in bulk. A larger starship would accommodate these needs, reducing the number of launches and ensuring that the settlement has everything required for long-term survival. Furthermore, the 18-meter starship could revolutionize lunar missions by delivering an entire base and infrastructure in a single flight, accelerating humanity's efforts to establish a permanent presence on the moon. So far, a bigger starship seems like a very great idea. So what would it take to turn this vision into reality? But first, if you're enjoying this video, please consider subscribing and leaving a like. It really helps the channel grow. Thanks, and let's get back to it. Of course, an 18-meter rocket doesn't just need more space. It needs way more fuel, way more structure, and most importantly, a huge jump in thrust. Right now, the Super Heavy Booster uses 33 Raptor V2 engines, each putting out 230 tons of thrust. That's already incredibly powerful. But to lift something this massive, we could be looking at over 130 engines if we stick with that thrust level. But here's the good news. The new Raptor 3 engine is already pushing 280 tons of thrust, with 300 tons in sight. So with more powerful engines, SpaceX might not need quite so many. SpaceX is constantly evolving and improving the Raptor engine. 
so for the 18-meter Starship, they could very well develop a new kind of engine. Elon has also said that a complete design overhaul is necessary for the engine that can actually make life multi-planetary. It won't even be called Raptor anymore. A roughly two times larger Super Raptor engine could benefit from turbo machinery efficiency gains, likely allowing for higher chamber pressure without requiring a significant increase in compressor exit pressure. The combustion chamber would be comparable in size to Blue Origin's BE-4, which suggests it would avoid the kind of instability seen in engines like the F-1. Thanks to turbine scaling laws, this larger engine could potentially reach chamber pressures of 450 to 500 bar, with only minimal changes to compressor outlet pressure compared to current designs. If SpaceX succeeds in developing a more powerful engine, it could significantly reduce the complexity of an 18-meter vehicle. Ideally, an engine that is four to five times more powerful than the current Raptor would allow for a much lower engine count, simplifying the associated plumbing and wiring. This reduction in complexity would help bring the concept of an 18-meter launch vehicle within the realm of practical feasibility. Building a giant rocket is one thing, but building the base to build it is another. This is not an uncommon problem in the rocket industry, as you might think. In fact, the rocket that took us to the moon had this problem. Initially, NASA planned to send humans to the moon using a Nova-class rocket. This vehicle would have featured eight F-1 engines on its first stage and a diameter of 12 meters. However, production constraints at the government-owned Michoud Ordnance Plant near New Orleans, Louisiana, where Saturn's first stages were assembled, posed a significant challenge. The height of the factory roof at Michoud made it impossible to build a 12-meter diameter launch vehicle. As a result, NASA had to limit designs to a maximum diameter of about 10 meters, accommodating only four or five F-1 engines. This constraint effectively ruled out the Nova-class rocket for missions involving direct ascent to the Moon or Earth orbit rendezvous. In 1962, NASA approved the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous approach, leading to the development of the smaller Saturn C-5, which became known as the Saturn V, and the rest is history. Anyway, a scaled-up starship would be an entirely different beast, requiring substantial changes at every stage of development and operation. SpaceX would need a new production site tailored to its immense size. This would involve constructing a much larger bay, expanded tank farms, and thicker steel rings than those currently used. Launch and testing infrastructure would also need a complete redesign. The existing launch pad and water deluge system are unlikely to withstand the heat and vibrations produced by 130 Raptor engines firing simultaneously. While SpaceX has a strong track record of rapidly upgrading its systems, building infrastructure robust enough for such a colossal rocket remains a major engineering challenge. For example, the current Mechazilla launch tower is designed to catch Starship and its super heavy booster during landing. However, attempting to catch a vehicle four times the size and mass of today's Starship would be extremely difficult. One possible solution might be to abandon the tower catching approach entirely and return to traditional ground landings. Transportation is another major obstacle. No existing road, rail, or barge route is large enough to move a vehicle of this size. The Brownsville Port Connector measures approximately 14 to 15 meters wide, which means it could technically accommodate a 12-meter diameter starship, but not an 18-meter version. To overcome this, SpaceX would likely need to both build and launch the rocket at the same location, minimizing transportation altogether. But perhaps the most difficult hurdle is regulatory. Launching a rocket of this scale would require years of environmental testing and regulatory approval. Issues such as shock waves, emissions from fuel combustion, and public safety would need to be carefully studied and addressed before such a vehicle could be cleared for flight. Now, there is a way to solve most of these difficulties, and that is to take the ship out to sea.
The most obvious benefit of sea-based launches is safety. Even with reusable rockets, there's always a risk of failure. If a rocket were to experience a rapid unscheduled disassembly, ROD, mid-flight, debris could fall over populated areas. Launching from the ocean significantly reduces this risk by ensuring that any falling parts land in the sea. In addition to improved safety, sea launches help minimize noise and shock waves, making them more appealing to regulatory agencies such as the FAA. In fact, launching a massive rocket from the sea is not a new idea. Back in 1962, Captain Robert C. Truax, a rocket engineer with the United States Navy, proposed an ambitious concept called Sea Dragon. Standing 150 meters tall and 23 meters in diameter, Sea Dragon was a two-stage, sea-launched, orbital super-heavy lift vehicle capable of delivering an incredible 550 metric tons, or 1.2 million pounds, into low Earth orbit. Truax's core idea was to develop a low-cost heavy-lift rocket, a concept now known as a Big Dumb Booster. To reduce operational costs, the rocket would launch directly from the ocean, requiring minimal ground infrastructure. A large ballast tank attached to the bottom of the first stage engine bell would tilt the rocket upright for launch. In this vertical position, the payload, located at the top of the second stage, would sit just above the waterline, allowing easy access for final checks and integration. Truax had already tested aspects of this system through earlier prototypes, like the CB and Seahorse. To keep costs down, the Sea Dragon was to be constructed from inexpensive materials, such as 8mm thick steel sheeting. It would be built at a seaside shipyard and towed into open water for launch. The design emphasized wide engineering margins, simple construction, and strong, durable materials to enhance reliability while minimizing complexity and cost. The rocket system was also envisioned to be at least partially reusable. Rocket sections would passively re-enter the atmosphere and be recovered at sea for refurbishment and relaunch. A typical mission would begin with the rocket being refurbished and assembled on shore where RP-1 fuel would be loaded. It would then be towed to a designated launch area. There, liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen would be produced on site using electrolysis powered, according to Truax, by a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. Once in position, the ballast tanks would be flooded, raising the rocket to a vertical orientation with the upper stage above water. Final checks could then be performed before liftoff. Of course, this remains a rough concept, and such a project has never been fully implemented. Maintenance at sea is notoriously challenging and costly. Marine operations, especially at a high launch cadence, add further complexity. Payload handling can also be delicate and requires significant space. So, to apply this to the 18-meter Starship, these are factors that SpaceX needs to consider. But before any of that, the priority is ensuring their current 9-meter Starship operates reliably once it can launch, land, and be reused consistently and efficiently, then it will make sense to explore increasing the vehicle's diameter.